Let's talk about some camera tips if you're operating the camera for laparoscopic procedures. So the camera has what's called the parallax effect, which is the effect that you have that when you're looking directly at something, say you're looking at a clock, you, you look at it directly on, that's the most accurate picture that you're going to get. And then if you move off to one side or the other, it's going to change where that minute or hour hand looks like it is on the clock. Well, you have the same effect with your camera. So just to be aware of that sometimes when you're using an instrument and you're coming in from the side, it may be a little bit different than it if it was a direct view. Your fluid, I say, is your friend during laparoscopic surgery because sometimes the fluid helps you orient horizontal line. So you can be looking at that to see where the fluid is. The scope is going to fog up if it's cold because when you put it in a warm body then you have the temperature difference and that's going to cause it to fog up. So they usually have some sort of warmer, sometimes they have a like a thermos with it or they have these warming disposable devices that will keep the scope warm so that when they put it in it doesn't fog up. The other thing they have is the anti-fog and with the anti-fog you rub that on. Some doctors like to dribble some on just straight uh, to help keep it from fogging and once in a while if it fogs up during the procedure and you have your irrigation you're in there using it for whatever reason you can actually squirt it off with the suction irrigator and then if you have a if it's if, if that water is laying across the lens then all you have to do and it's a little bit tricky is to take that suction that you've just irrigated off and touch the tip to the bottom of the scope and it will wick off that water drop from it and then you'll have a clear picture usually. Um, the surgeon's body language and the instruments telegraph a lot of information to you as far as what you need to do, what you need to be doing to help with the camera motions that you're doing. For instance, if the doctor is leaning forward and squinting his eyes, it means he's trying to get a closer view and it's just instinct for a person to do that when they want to see something closer. So that's giving you a clue. When the instruments are moving, that again will give you a clue as to what you want to do. Um, I always say go where the action is. If something is moving, you should be following it most of the time with your camera. And you want to have your camera centered if possible. It's not always possible, but you want to have it kind of centered on where the action is and then where the action is going to be. If you are going into a new site and the site of the operation has changed and you're getting another instrument to put in or the camera, then you, if you're not sure where to look with that camera, then you want to orient to, you can look on the outside and orient your camera to what you're looking at. For instance, if he's putting a new port in and you look at the outside where his finger is and then you move the camera to line up with that, you'll be in the correct position. If they're cauterizing something, then you want to make sure that on the camera that you have the entire view of the metal tip because the whole metal tip will be conducting electricity. And then you also want to be sure that if there's anything in the area like bowel or adhesions that might be near something that he does not want to cauterize or dissect, that that is also visible. Because if it's close, he may get it accidentally if he can't see it. So you want to make sure that's on the monitor. If um, they're putting in a liver retractor, then you want to make sure that you can see the tip of that liver retractor. If it's a flexible kind, it's going to be bending like this as they tighten it up on the outside, then that tip can cause damage either going in or coming out. So you want to make sure that you can visualize it on the camera. If you have a dark picture, what are some of the problems that you can have? Well, the cord could be bad. Some of the old cords were that thin fiber optic and they bent easily and then the fiber op optic pieces or glass would start breaking and then you get these little pinpoints of light along the light cord. And if you had a light cord that light lit up like a, a city skyline at night, well then you knew that a lot of those fibers were broken and that it was probably going to be dark. They make it a little bit stronger nowadays, but if you may have those old ones and you're looking for that. Or the scope, the fibers in the scope itself may be bad. If you have a 5 scope versus a 10 scope, a 10 scope gives a little more light because it's bigger. So it's going to be a little darker with a 5 and sometimes you need to get a little bit closer with a 5 to be able to see as well. So what are some of the things you can do? You can turn the brightness up. 
Sometimes you can turn the gain up. These are things you can try. You can try manual instead of auto. And then one thing that's important, sometimes uh, if it's been bleeding in that area and there's blood in the area, blood absorbs light and it will make it dark. So just to be aware of that, no, it's nothing wrong with the scope, nothing wrong with the, the cords. It's the fact that the blood's there and the blood is absorbing the light, so it's going to be darker. On the opposite hand, if you have something white in the area, then like a glove that's close to the, the lens, then it's going to glare it out. So I mentioned earlier that you want to go where the action is. You want to center when possible. Now if the surgeon is looking for a dissection plane, he's going to be looking around so you know that when he's looking for a new plane to dissect or to grab something if he's doing a hand assisted, then you want to back that camera up and give a wide angle so he can see the whole picture and be able to move to where he needs to be. And then when he's ready to either dissect or cauterize, then he's doing fine work and you want to be up close with that camera so that he can see exactly what he's doing. You have an angled scope. We have 30 degree and 45 degree. Anytime you have an angled scope, the angle on the tip of the scope is going to be opposite the angle of where the cord is and I'm going to try to demonstrate a little bit. So if you have a cord that's going up like this then you know that the angle is pointing down here and then if you shift to the side in here it's going to be angled back this way and the opposite is going to be angled that way. So you just know which way it's angling by where the cord is. Now once in a while you have a cord that's heavy and it can tend to, the weight of the cord will tend to pull it off and keep changing that angle. And I've had that happen a couple of times. So what do you do in that situation? Well, you take that cord and pretend my hands, this hand's not here, but I have to do it to hold that on. You can just take that cord and while you're holding the camera, you can also hold the cord to control it. Or if it's on a camera holder, there was one day when it kept doing that, kept slipping off to the side so I just looped it over the camera holder that it was on and that kept that cord from moving. If you're losing your free space you want to retract your scope into the sheath because you don't want that light to be the scope to be burning anything. Now some of the new ones are not as hot as the old ones and they're less likely to burn but you still want to pull it into your trocar sheath and away from the underlying organs that it might be touching. Sometimes you have the trocar diaphragm is sticky and meaning that it doesn't slide easily. It kind of goes in a jerky motion. So if you're using the camera, it kind of jerks when you're putting it on. So what you can do with that, if you have a free hand on that one, you can, here's the trocar, say the trocar is here and you're operating it with this hand. You can take your other hand and just kind of help guide it. And, and that helps steady that camera out. But that you can only do that if you have a free hand. Now, if you're needing to hold the scope and it's on the opposite side of the table from you, but it's only going to be for a very short time, for instance, when you're doing a gallbladder and it's they want to, they're trying to bag the gallbladder and they're ready to take it out, rather than run around to the other side of the table and grab it, you can actually take, um, pretend this is a scope, and this is the abdominal wall here. So instead of reaching up here, which is going to burn your arm here if you do it for any length of time, and here's your abdominal wall, you can actually just hold it like this for as long as it's going to take, which isn't going to be very long, to get that gallbladder out. Or other instances when you only have to hold it for a short amount of time. Now if it's like a bowel resection that you're going to be operating the camera on the opposite side for a long time, well then you need to go around the table because you're not going to be able to do that and manipulate it over a long period of time. Then one of the things sometimes with um, when I'm doing some of the bariatric surgery that I do or if the surgeon's trying to use a stapler and you're, you're holding the camera with his hand and you're going to be in his way and he just wants to fire it, what you can do for short periods of time when he's ready to go in, you can just hold your hand up and then your arm up and then he can come underneath and fire the stapler or do whatever he needs to do and then you can put it back down and rest it. So there you have some camera tips on operating it.